So thanks for checking out this video. I hope that through what you hear, you really grow to understand how much God has shown his love for us in Jesus. At Brainerd, we want to help people who are far from God to become committed followers of Jesus. But still, you know, nothing replaces what God does when followers of Jesus actually gather together in community as a church. So this video could never be a substitute for that. And our prayer is if you haven't found a church home, you would find that soon. And with that, let me tell you, we'd love to meet you sometime soon at Brainerd. So I pray that God speaks to you, and please reach out if we can answer any questions or serve you in any way. And so today we're in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. As you turn there, um, all of us probably at some point in our lives have went to someone, a family member, a spouse, a friend, a colleague at work, and we've asked some version of the question, how am I supposed to, how should I live? What should I do in this situation that I'm in? How do I uh, get this person to like me or that person to like me? What do, I, what do I do when this happens? How am I to live? Now, there's a certain kind of advice that all of us love when we ask a question like that. Let me give you an example of maybe what your grandmother would tell you in that situation. She would say, honey, you just be yourself. Has anybody else heard that? My grandmother told me that often. I've had friends that have said, bro, you just do you. Other people have told me, follow your heart. You do what feels right to you. And my favorite one, you're perfect just the way you are. And if it says sweetie at the end of that, that's even better. Those are nice responses, aren't they? The responses that tell us exactly what we want to hear, they affirm us as to who we are, they make us feel confident about ourselves, they tell us what we want to believe about ourselves, that if, we just, if we're just ourselves, everything is going to go right. There's a lot of truth in those, advice, in that, those pieces of advice. Um, you know, the Lord, our Creator, He didn't want us just to be uniform robots that just all kind of march all at the same time. Be, no, He made us creatively. You look around the room and you see the people that are in here and we're all different, different giftings, different personalities, different ways that we do things. We're all uniquely different. And through that uniqueness, we give glory to our Savior. But there's something that I've learned about myself, maybe something that you have experienced as well, is that sometimes when I just do me, when I'm myself, when I follow my heart, it's amazing how many times that I end up with a chicken sandwich combo and a milkshake in my hands. <laughs> Sounds pretty good, doesn't it? Sounds like something that most of us would affirm and that we like. It sounds pretty good until we look at the end of the month and we look at our uh, monthly budget and we realize how much that much chicken costs. It sounds pretty good until we uh, look and we go visit the doctor and we learn of all the health benefits of a steady diet of fried chicken, french fries, and ice cream. It's a funny example for us as we think about that advice because being myself, doing me, following my heart, advice like that, it, it doesn't always reser result in the outcomes that I aspire to attain to, to obtain to. As a follower of Jesus, being myself, me doing me, following my heart, oftentimes when I just do me, it will lead me to places that I don't want to go to. It will lead me to do things that I don't necessarily need to be doing. Advice like that will lead me into sin, and then it will lead me to excuse myself for that sin. It will cause me to identify with whatever that sin is that I, I see as, well, I, that's just me being me. The Lord, it's not true, but the Lord just made me that way. That's just the way I am. We say that's just the way we are. I'm, I'm just impatient. I, I, I'm just, I'm just kind of grumpy. It's just my personality. I, you know, I'm just a diva. I'm just selfish. I'm just prone to this sexual sin or that sexual sin. Our natural inclinations, they make us more prone to excess than moderation. Our own desires, they lead us to consume this set of trash or that set of trash. That's what happens when we just follow our heart. We just do us. We just do what feels right. Oftentimes, the, 
what happens within us doesn't take us to where the Lord wants us to be and really where we want to be as followers of Jesus. Here's the prom- primary problem with that advice. As a follower of Jesus, you aren't called to be you. You're called to be like Jesus. As a follower of Jesus, you aren't called to follow your heart. You're called to follow the Savior who died on the cross for your sins. In this letter to the Ephesian church, what we've been studying the last several weeks, Paul has taught and explained over and over and over what the gospel is, how good it is, and how we are found and we find our identity in Christ. If we believe in Him, if we've confessed our sins, if we commit to follow Him as Lord, we are no longer identified by who we are, by us being us, by our own heart, but we are identified by what our Savior did for us, the sacrifice that He gave for us. We find our identity in Christ. Life in Christ as a follower of Jesus, it leads us actually to act contrary to what we would, how we would normally act, contrary to our natural desires. Paul, after explaining who we are in Christ, our identity in Christ, if you remember last week, Paul does what? He goes to his knees and he begins to pray. He prays for us, for all those who will follow and try to apply what he's taught in the first three chapters with what he's about to say the application is in the next three chapters. He asks that the Holy Spirit would fill us and would give us the power to be and to use God's power to walk in Christ, to be like Jesus. And then he prays that we would learn and understand that our knowledge knowledge of God's love for us would grow and grow and grow. In three chapters of this letter, Paul's only used one verb that's a command, telling us to do something. And that one word was, was remember. He says, remember, look back at what Jesus has done. But then in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1, there's a hinge that's about to change. This verse is going to move us from explanation to application. He's explained, Paul has, who we are in Christ, and now he's about to tell us how we are to live because of who we are in Christ. From Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1, all the way to chapter 6, verse 20, Paul is going to share with us imperative after imperative, application after application. This is how you live in this situation with that person and with this person, with that group and with this group. He's going to tell us how we live and how we are to reflect the gospel to others. Not a single time in these chapters, as the rest of this book plays out, is Paul going to say, be yourself. He's not going to say, you do you. He's not going to say, follow your heart. He's going to say, walk in Christ. So with that in mind, where we've gotten to, what's brought us to this point in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1, if you would, I'd love for you to join me there. Paul begins by saying, therefore. He's pointing back to those truths that he's taught because of who we are in Christ. Therefore, because of who we are in Christ, I, the prisoner in the Lord, I urge you to walk worthy of the calling that you have received. Don't walk in your old identity. Walk in your new identity. Paul defined that new identity earlier in the book. He said in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 5, he said, God made us alive with Christ. Even though we were dead in trespasses, you were saved by grace. Grace, We were moved from death to life. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. For you are saved by grace through faith. This is not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not from works so that no one can boast. We have been saved by God's grace as a gift. We're sinners saved by grace through faith, not of our works, but by His mercy and His grace. For those who put their faith in Jesus, our identity found in Christ. The phrase is summarized in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 13. But now, in Christ, you who were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. That is such good news. That news tells us is that we, there is no distance There's no way that we can go so far out that God can't reach us with His grace and bring us close to Him. That is good news. God's grace reached all the way to those Gentiles, people like us, far from God, separated. Paul described them as excluded, foreigners, without hope, without God in the world. The love of God reached all the way to them, all sinners, every race, every demographic, every person. Christ's blood was sufficient for the salvation of all people, every nation, every tribe, every tongue. 
Romans 10, Paul writes to the church in Rome and he says basically the same thing. He gives this good news in verses 11 through 13. Everyone who believes on him will not be put to shame. There's no distinction between Jew and Greek because the same Lord of all of all richly blesses all who call on him. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. That is good news. It's good news that leads us to share the gospel here. It's good news that causes us to get into water in front of a bunch of people, some we don't even know, and give testimony that we're a follower of Jesus through baptism. It's good news that causes us that we're at whatever our, pos- our position is, that we're willing to go to the ends of the earth and share the gospel. It is that good. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Paul paints this beautiful picture, a mosaic of redeemed sinners being put together, formed together, living stones, forming a holy temple where the Spirit will dwell among us. And through that temple, God intends, plans, expects for His glory to be reflected to all those who don't know Him. The gospel, it's not just a picture of who I am. It's not just a picture of who you are. It's a picture of who we are together. A bunch of redeemed people brought together with our unique personalities and styles and preferences reflecting the same gospel, reflecting an identity found in Him. Therefore, Paul writes, I, the prisoner in the Lord, I urge you to walk worthy of the calling that you have received. After holding back his uh, gospel teach, the gospel application for this long, Paul, he, he doesn't kindly suggest He doesn't give the recommendation. If you look back, what does Paul say? Prisoner in chains. He says, I urge you to walk worthy of the call. He exhorts, he pleads, he calls on these followers of Jesus, people just like us, to walk worthy of the calling that they've received. You see, we can't earn our identity in Christ. In his strength, though, we can be worthy of it. As followers of Jesus, we're clothed in Christ's righteousness. We can't earn that clothing. We don't prove that we deserve that clothing, but we can't grow into it. Just like a toddler who puts on his dad's suit. He didn't pay for that suit. He doesn't deserve that suit, but he can grow into that suit to be the man just like his dad is, that his dad wants him to be. What do we do that by walking in Christ. That's who we are. We, we, we model, we live our life worthy of what we're intended to be. There are references throughout Scripture all the way from one cover to the other talking about what it means to walk. It's how we spend our life. It's how we walk every day, how we live, how we spend our days. We're called to walk in righteousness, walk in the light. These references tell us how we are to live. You don't have to do very many Bible studies to find God telling us in His Word how we're to walk. Paul says, walk worthy of the calling you've received. Walk worthy of the identity you have. Walk in Christ. The main point of our sermon today is this. Though redeemed by Christ from diverse contexts, believers find unity in their shared identity and their common commitments. Though redeemed by Christ, from diverse contexts and backgrounds and stories and family histories, all those things, all the differences that we have. Believers, we find our unity in a shared identity in Christ and common commitments to walk in Christ. Who are we? What is our identity? We are in Christ. How are we to live? What are we committed to? We're committed to walking in Christ. Walking worthy of our identity in Christ means that we commit to walk in step with Christ's example. We'll see that in verses 2 and 3. And then we'll see that walking worthy of our identity in Christ, it means that we're to commit to walk in step with God's Word. In our diverse world where any difference, geographical, linguistic, ethnic, cultural, political, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, all the ways that we can be different, they seem to be reason to divide us rather than to bring us together. What binds us as followers of Jesus together, people with distinct lives, distinct living stones being put together by Christ to form this new holy temple, the mortar that holds us together 
There's a shared identity in Christ and common commitments as to how we will live our life in Christ. Let's look back at our passage, Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. Therefore I, the prisoner in the Lord, urge you to walk worthy of the calling you've received with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of a peace. Let's make this simple today. How, how is Paul asking us to live? Does that sound what he's described here in these verses? Does it sound like anyone that you've heard, maybe you've read about, maybe a character in the Bible? Philippians chapter 2 verse 5, Paul gives it away. He says, adopt the same attitude as that of Christ Jesus. Walking worthy of our identity in Christ means that we commit to walk in step with Christ's example. Most of us have been walking before with a friend or our kids or a spouse, and as we're walking, we all of a sudden notice that we're walking in step with someone. Our steps are falling at the same time that their steps are falling. We've all experienced that, haven't we? Soldiers, they run in, in, in unison in step with one another. They march in unison with one another. They walk in unison with one another. They shout out cadence to know that with one another, each beat, there's the right foot's landing when it's supposed to land, and the left foot's landing when it's supposed to land. We as followers of Jesus, if we're to live worthy of the calling that we've received, we're called to just simply fall in step with the example that Jesus has given us, to walk as He walked, to maintain cadence with Jesus. It, it takes commitment and effort, though. Just like when we fall in step with one another, we realize that it happens unconsciously, but to continue to do it, we have to really think about it, and we have to make those steps fall one and the other. We have different strides. We walk at different pace, paces. Here's how Jesus walks. In case you're wanting to walk in step with Him, Jesus walks with humility, with gentleness. He walks with patience, bearing with others in love, working to maintain unity in the body. As we look at those paces, how Jesus walked, that first step that He takes is a step of humility. Humility isn't a valued uh, characteristic in, to the church that Paul is writing to in Ephesus. And if we're honest and, and admit it, it's not really a characteristic that our society really honors either, is it? The humble person is somebody that's viewed as being weak, somebody that really doesn't have anything to be proud of. And so humility is just what they do because they have to do it. We value people that have pride and confidence, people that... Uh, people that uh, walk into a room and, and they demand attention. Personally, the world will teach us that we need to be self-promoters. You don't wait on someone else to promote you. You promote yourself. Social media is a great example of this. Everything that we do needs to be Instagram worthy. We don't want to put uh, real truthful pictures up. We put pictures up of our best, the best pictures of us, who we want to be, who we want the world to see us as. Our desire to be self-promoters is actually a it's actually the fruit of pride. We love us, and we want others to love us. And so we promote ourselves. We focus on ourselves. Tim Keller said, the essence of gospel humility is not thinking more of myself. It's not thinking less of myself. It's thinking of myself less. You see, humility, it's, it's, it's focusing not on me, but on you. It's not an inward focus, it's an outward focus. Jesus modeled humility when He took a basin of water, a towel, and dirty feet. Jesus modeled humility when He prayed in the garden of the Father and He said, not my will, but your will be done, Lord. Jesus modeled humility for us as He hung on the cross, bearing our sins, and He prayed the prayer, Lord, forgive them, they know not what they do. To walk in step with Jesus in humility is to walk like Jesus. He walked in humility and he walked in gentleness. Gentleness was seen as, 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 as uh, the next step. Some people translate gentleness here as self-control. What does that mean? Why do they use self-control and gentleness? Why are they synonymous with one another? Well, true gentleness isn't observed in the weak and the delicate. It's actually best observed when the strong and the powerful have self-control. True gentleness is demonstrated by the restraint of force, purposeful gentleness, 
That's what we see, G- see in Jesus. Gentleness was seen as he was led away by the soldiers in the garden. Peter pulls out his sword and he cuts off the ear of a servant. Jesus says, put away your sword. And he looks at his disciple and he says, or do you not think that I cannot call on my Father and he will provide me here and now with more than 12 legions of angels? You see, Jesus offered himself as a sacrifice, as gentle as a sacrificial lamb, even though he had all the power of an almighty God behind him. He chose gentleness. He also demonstrates how we are to relate to one another. The first step, humility. The second step, gentleness. And then he demonstrates that he was patient, long-suffering with others. He demonstrated what it means to bear with one another in love. Paul writes to the church in, in Corinth in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 13, verses 4 and 6. He describes what these two look like. How are we supposed to relate to one another? How do we walk in step like Jesus with others? He says love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not envy. It is not boastful. It's not arrogant. It's not rude. It's not self-seeking. It's not irritable. It doesn't keep a record of wrongs. Paul goes on to say, love bears all things. Love believes all things. Love hopes all things. Love endures all things. Walking in step with Jesus. Step by step, we walk in the love of Jesus with others. Verse 3 says that we make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. That bond of peace was explained in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 14. He says, for he, Jesus, is our peace. What's the bond that draws us together, that leads us as to how we're supposed to walk? It's Jesus. For he is our peace who made both groups, talking of the Jews and the Gentiles, all people. He made us all one. He tore down the dividing wall of hostility. We're to work at and we're to cultivate unity based on a shared peace that we've all found in Jesus if we've trusted in Him. In Christ, we're brothers and sisters walking hand in hand with one another in peace. In the flesh, we're brothers and sisters at war with one another fighting like cats and dogs. We must walk in the peace of Christ. Our commitment to walk in step with Jesus is a commitment to practice His humility, His gentleness, His patience, His love. This commitment, it it will cultivate unity between all of those who commit to walk in that same cadence. The world, you see, is mistaken. It calls for unity all of the time. But the way that the world defines unity is by saying, I want to identify all of the things that I don't like or disagree with with everyone else, and unity will be found in everyone being and doing, believing, thinking what I believe. Unity is not found in correcting others. Unity is found in cultivating the Spirit within me, my walk with Jesus, that I treat others as Jesus would treat them. Our desire to walk worthy of our identity in Christ demands a commitment to walk in step with Jesus' example. It also demands a commitment to walk in step with God's Word. Commit to walk in step with God's Word. Verses 4 through 6. There's one body, one Spirit, Paul writes. Just as you were called to one hope at your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father, Father of all, Father of all who is above all and through all and in all. The obvious question as we read these passages, as we think about what Paul's writing here is to ask ourselves, are we really committed to walk in God's word? Not do we affirm God's Word, that we hear it and we nod our head and say, yeah, 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 I believe all that stuff. But are we willing to walk in it? In these verses, Paul affirms these principal theological beliefs found in God's Word. Let's look at them again. There's one body, the church. Paul's written earlier in this letter that all those who put their faith in Jesus have been reconciled to one body by the cross. He's talking about big C church here. 
all the followers of Jesus, but the implications apply to Little C Church, local families of faith like Brainerd. We affirm that we've been reconciled to one body, and that happened through the one Spirit who is at work within us, the Holy Spirit convicting us of our sin, the Holy Spirit uh, helping us, guiding us to faith. We put our faith in Jesus, and the Holy Spirit works in us to transform us to be more like Jesus. It's from the convicting and the calling of the Spirit that we find that one hope in Jesus a hope that we can trust in. We put our faith in Jesus, and when we do that, we submit to Him as our one Lord. The truth of the gospel of Jesus is where we place our one faith, a faith that we believe, that we trust in, what we hope in, what we live for. We publicly profess that faith. When we do uh, what we saw today, we go into the a baptism pool and we are baptized, giving a public profession of faith through that one baptism. All of this is rooted, all these truths, rooted in the knowledge of the one true God. It's the God who made Himself known as the great I Am. It's the one that the children of Israel were raised up to call, and they were called to love with all their heart, with all their soul, with all their strength. It's the one that they were taught about as they were rose up in the morning, as they went to bed at night. The Lord, their God, the Lord is one. He's the God who's above all and through all and in all. Paul affirms all of these statements, and we may be tempted to just breeze past them and to affirm them as well, to say, yeah, yeah, I believe all that stuff. But to do that, it really misses the gravity of what Paul has just affirmed. Remember where he is, and remember this is application. This is not just head knowledge. This is heart knowledge, how we are to live Paul says this in a polytheistic cult context, a world where there are many gods, many people, many gods worshiping all of these folks. And Paul just says to all of those people, there is only one God. In our world, absolute truth like this is repulsive to some. To think that we've got some exclusive corner on truth, well, the world just rejects that. One baptism. What that does is it implies that any other profession of faith, that that's not the right, that's not the primary one. We profess our faith in the church, in the context of the church, through being immersed in water in the way that we've seen today. One faith asserts that all the other faiths are wrong, all of the other religious beliefs that are happening there in that context in Ephesus. One faith is what Paul writes. One Lord. It means that the goddess Artemis that we've heard about, it means that Caesar in Rome, they're no Lord. There's one Lord, and His name is Jesus. Our one hope is found only in Jesus. The Spirit empowers us, unites us into one body, a living temple that will declare the truths of God's Word, implying that there's also one mission, One mission that we're supposed to reflect the gospel, reflect Jesus with our lives in our body together. In Paul's day and in ours, these truths are divisive because of their exclusivity. One body, one spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all. Committing to hold the absolute exclusive truths of Scripture, it sets us at odd with the culture and the world that we live in. It will cost us. It will cost us to walk in them. It will isolate us. It makes us an outsider. It leads us to walk down paths that where we could find persecution. Paul writes this letter in bonds. He's a prisoner in Christ. Why was he a prisoner? Because he was unwilling to compromise the truth of the gospel. All of these ones, he sits in prison writing this letter because he walked in those truths, unwilling to compromise those truths. There's something about a common commitment to walk worthy of our calling, a commitment to walk in step with Jesus' example, a commitment to walk in God's Word that binds us together. For people who've made that commitment to live a unique lifestyle that gives testimony of the gospel to an onlooking world, oftentimes we feel, we feel isolated, separated, it costs us persecution. We're tempted to uh, just turn back and maybe not be as bold as what we should be. And then we look to our right, look to our left, and we see others like us who have committed to live their lives in the same way. 
similar lifestyles, similar feelings that they're walking through, and we become united by, in Christ by a bond that's much stronger than anything that the world has to offer. You see, today around the world, there are followers of Jesus who are gathered in big buildings and under trees. We worship today with diverse languages and diverse places and diverse styles, diverse preferences, all the different ways that all the people around the world gather and worship today. As we join them together, we join them as followers of Jesus, and we worship our Lord today, what would probably sound to us like a garbled up mess, I wonder if it doesn't sound to our Heavenly Father like a choir singing in beautiful harmony. The voices of His adopted children who look diverse, younger, older, shorter, taller, bigger, smaller, darker, lighter, different in as many ways as we can imagine, all worshiping the same God, the same Savior, finding our identity in Him, united in that identity, committed to worship Him, not just with our voice, but with our life. As we think about these commitments, walking in His example, and we think about walking in God's Word, we think about what that looks like together. My prayer for Brainerd, for our church family, this local expression of faith that is of God's universal church, when we think about unity, I pray that we will find our unity based in those things. We don't seek unity for the sake of unity. We find unity because of a shared identity in Jesus. We are all in Him. We find unity today because of common commitments, commitments to live our lives in such a way that people will see Jesus in us and want to know that same Jesus. And when we live that way, we find unity. Today, as we gathered, people walked into buildings, venues, services, campuses, all over our Brainerd family in different places. My prayer is that they saw that unity, unity that pointed them to Jesus. And there may be some, one here that sits in this place today, and you've heard about this Jesus who gives us an identity, who shows us how to walk, and you want to know Him today. Well, you can do that, and you'll be much more than a brother or sister. You'll get to know our Savior personally as your Heavenly Father. You can do that by confessing your sin believing in Him, putting your faith in Him, and committing to walk in His ways in the days that the Word gives you. If you're a follower of Jesus, you walked into this room today, and you're realizing as you think about how you've been told to walk, that maybe your walk's not worthy of the calling that you've received. Maybe if people follow your example, they don't see the example of Jesus. Maybe if they see, they hear you with your voice give affirmation, but they see you with your life not be committed to walk in His Word. Maybe today is the day that you recommit yourself to say, I I want to walk in Him again. I want to follow His example. I want to walk in His Word. Paul says, therefore, I, the prisoner in the Lord, I urge you, I plead with you, I beg you to walk worthy of the calling that you have received. May each of us be found worthy of the calling and the identity that we find in Jesus today. Let's pray together. Lord, we love you. We thank you. We praise you. We thank you, Lord, for a grace that is so good, a reach that's so far that people like us get to know you, know you as our personal Savior. Lord, I ask you that there's one here today that walked in not knowing you, that they won't walk out, Lord, the same. I pray, Lord, that if there's one that came into this place today and their walk doesn't doesn't seem quite worthy of the sacrifice and the grace that they've received. I pray that we would commit ourselves again to walk, Lord, in such a way, Lord, that you're known because of the way that we love you, the way that we follow you, the way that we walk in step with you. May this be our personal testimony and may it be the testimony of our church family today. We love you. We thank you. It's in your name we pray. Amen.